This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Hi friend, welcome to another episode of the ODAT Chad podcast. I am so grateful you are joining me today. If you're new here, my name is Arlena and you are joining your fellow listeners in over 42 countries now. For this week's sobriety birthday spotlight, I'd like to give a shout out to my sweet friend Suzanne who is celebrating her third year milestone on December 6th. Congrats Suzanne and thank you so much for your service. If you'd like me to wish you or your friend a happy sobriety day, you can message me through the ODAT chat Facebook group. So this is a podcast where my guests and I talk about how to recover from alcoholism and addiction. I'm looking to uncover the causes and conditions of addiction, the lessons learned in recovery, and the tools and practices which lead to long-term recovery. Today, my guest is Jesse Harless, recovery coach and author of Smash Your Comfort Zone with Cold Showers, (laughs) How to Boost Your Energy, Defeat Your Anxiety, and Overcome Unwanted Habits. Uh, Before we get into the interview, I have a couple of resources to share with you. So the first resource is a dietary program called Metabolic Balance. It's offered through my husband's nutrition practice. I've lost a total of 18 pounds by learning what specific foods are good for my specific body through a blood test. I lost the majority of the weight in the first six weeks. The meal plan that was developed for me answered the three big questions I always had. So it was what to eat, how much, and when. It it takes all the guesswork out for me, so it taught me how to take care of my body as it is now, right? So, um, which is very different from the body I had 10 years ago, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, there are no shakes, no pills. It's just the right foods and the right amounts uh, for my specific body chemistry, right? So Bob lost 40 pounds. Um, Actually, he lost 47 pounds himself. And um, this was so life-changing for him that he started this practice and is now working with a group on their health goals. There's a new group starting January 4th. So if you'd like to know more, just visit my metabolic diet diet.com or message me through the ODAT chat Facebook page. So the other resource I have for you is geared towards boosting your self-esteem. So it's an online class starting December 12th, and it's offered through SoberLifeSchool.com. It's called the Connection Cure, How to Build Self-Esteem, Break Out of the Isolation Trap, and Create Lasting Change. Building self-esteem is the key component to transformation and cultivating the life you want to create. I don't care if you are just getting started on your journey of recovery or if you have been practicing for many years. Everyone can benefit from improving your self-esteem through authentic connection with others just like you. This is actually a working class. Um, The class includes all of the best tools and exercises that have helped me and millions of others transform their lives. So together in a live online class, you will have the support and momentum you need to create these lasting changes. This will be the founders class starting December 12th at seven o'clock Pacific Standard Time. It will be live online for six weeks with a safe and intimate group. Recordings will be made available through the private Facebook group. So if you're interested, sign up today at SoberLifeSchool.com. So Uh, On today's uh, podcast, we have Jesse Harless. He shares about the challenges he had growing up. Um, He was the youngest of three. He had an absent alcoholic father and a very hardworking single mother uh, who was always at work. And uh, we know how that goes. We talk a lot about how he became addicted to drugs, how he overcame that addiction, and how he has dedicated his life to helping others overcome their struggles. And of course, we talk about his book. I keep hearing about doing cold showers or cold plunges, things like that uh, from sources like uh, the Tim Ferriss podcast, uh, Wim Hof, this crazy guy. The work that he does is just too unbelievable. You you have to see it for yourself. He's all over YouTube. Uh, I met him, not met him personally, but he was actually at the Tony Robbins um, 
the Ultimate Power Within um, event in San Jose a couple years ago. This guy was a trip, but it was all about using cold water therapies. And so I've, I've heard of this many times. I was super curious. So um, Jesse wrote this book, and so and we were connected through many people. So Jesse came on and t- gave us his whole story and goes over the book and talks about how this uh, cold water therapy can actually um, help you transform your life. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Jesse. He's really a very thoughtful, deep, super nice guy, and he's just dedicated his life to um, helping other people. So I just love people like that. So anyway, um, with that, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. So with that, please enjoy this episode with Jesse. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for joining me on the Odat Chad podcast. Thank you, Arlene. I'm excited to be on this podcast with you today. Yeah, so I know you through the Genius Recovery Network, and we have lots of mutual friends, so I'm really excited to have you on today. Um, Your paperback was just released today, I think you said? Yes, yep, Smash Your Comfort Zone with Cold Showers. Paperback was finally released today, Uh, so yeah. Congratulations, that's amazing. That's a huge accomplishment, Um, something I aspire to, so thank you for being an inspiration and great encouragement for me as well. So um, typically what I do is um, I start the podcast out with, you know, what do you do professionally sort of just to give people an idea of um, who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, So professionally, I started a a company called Entrepreneurs in Recovery uh, last year. I had left a a career, um, a 13 year career to pursue my passion and purpose. You know, I just had this inner calling, this inner burning of um, doing more for what's going on in the, with this current uh, epidemic and what's happening. I was just like, you know, I'm sitting here selling for this company and I'm just like, I, I feel like I could figure out a way to do something on my own. So I started Entrepreneur's Recovery and the intention was to do life coaching, be like a life assister, life coach to people mm-hmm. in addiction recovery who are a little farther along but that are really ready to just explode their life and do big stuff. And uh, cause that's the momentum and trajectory I was on. So I wanted to help people do the same thing as I figured out how to be an entrepreneur and, and was, was an entrepreneur. I wanted to show others the same. So, you know, so, um, so I'm a life coach, I'm a speaker. Um, but one of the main things I do is facilitation and uh, group, group empowerment facilitation, or I call it appreciative recovery facilitation. Oh, very cool. What, what does that mean? So appreciative recovery facilitation is I take, I take um, clients or clients at treatment centers and sober living facilities through a, a one hour group where I help them to discover their purpose, their high point stories, their strengths wow. and create goals. And we do this all in an hour. And I also do it now with, um, I just did it with a town actually in North Carolina and uh, a little different uh, setup, but we are we were working together to try to find the best solutions uh, for community-based recovery in this town in uh, North Carolina, and mm-hmm. so it's it's kind of gone national. So, wow. it's uh, yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Now, you and I had been chatting earlier, and you mentioned that you were doing a, a workshop. Is that the workshop that you were telling me about? Yeah. This is yep. This is the facilitation workshop. Oh, um, very cool. Yep. So I do it locally here. I do it with, um, you know, I do it with, with treatment centers, sober living facilities, but now I'm, I'm doing it with, um, towns. There's, there's been, you know, people caught word of what I'm doing and they said, well, can you, can you help to heal our town from the epidemic and what's happening? And so I just facilitate a process. It's called appreciative inquiry and uh, I just adapted it to recovery. And yeah, so I went through a training uh, last year called uh, uh, Leading with Experiential Appreciative Facilitation. It's called LEAF Training from mm-hmm. Flourishing Leadership Institute. And uh, I took that training into addiction recovery. That is super cool. It's so needed too. Um, I think that's just amazing that city organizers identified a need for that and was willing to bring you in. So are you working with their um, teams internally or they have you – out doing outreach to rehab facilities. So, so what I did in North Carolina was, was definitely a first. I've never done anything like that. It was actually an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who, um, who was really passionate about recovery, uh, heard about me through, 
John Berghoff, who's the guy who, who, who runs Flourishing Leadership Institute. Mm-hmm. And this entrepreneur is like, I'm running this event in a few weeks. I love what you're doing here with the priesthood of inquiry. How can we do it there? And, and John said to talk to me. Oh, that's so, so cool. Yeah. So I went from doing it locally here with clients and people who are, who are at 28 day treatment centers to now doing it with, you know, uh, police and fire departments and the leaders wow. of the town to bring out the best of what, what they're already doing and what the future could look like. I'm taking notes because I just think that is so amazing that, I mean, those are the people that need it the most, right? The, the fire, the police officers and firefighters. I had a firefighter um, on the podcast and you know, the way he was talking about some of the things that they have to deal with, right? They're facing the trauma and the crisis. They're, I mean, they, these poor guys have PTSD, right? So, but they're interfaced the front lines to the community. So I think they're the ones who need the help the most. So I love that you're doing that. It's amazing. Yeah, a hundred percent. It was, it was really powerful experience and, and to know that, yeah, that the, the, that is the front line. I mean, that, you know, there, yeah, especially the town I was in is, it was hit really hard. So, um, so yeah, it's a town called Albemarle and, uh, they've been hit really hard and with what, so, yeah. um, with the epidemic, just, just heroin overdoses and, 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 you know, people overdosing on a daily basis and first responders coming with, you know, Narcan and helping them. And yeah, so it's, it's just, yeah. So they, they want, they want, answers they want they want help so yeah Alamar, okay that's uh you know and the heroin epidemic is just crazy and i keep hearing that they're approving stronger crazier drugs all the time so it's uh very disconcerting um okay and i know that you had um you went some rounds yourself with some heroin and things like that but um before we get there uh what I think would be really interesting, I'm always super curious about people's families, you know, like what your parents did for a living and your siblings and things like that. Do you want to take a few minutes to kind of just tell me like what, you know, and start with like what your dad did for a living? Sure. Um, so my dad, he, I didn't have a relationship with my father, uh, after five years old. He, um, previously to that, he was, um, he was stationed, he was in the military, he was stationed, uh, I believe in Germany, I'm not sure, uh, during Vietnam, and mm. he got addicted um, to, to heroin and cocaine when he was overseas, and uh, when he came back, he met my mom and uh, told her that, you know, I used to be addicted to heroin and cocaine, but I'm no longer doing that, so I'm on the right path, and she believed him, so she said, okay, and he got a job at the post office, and things were going well, and we actually lived in a, in a home, and and, um, and so... Uh, eventually things fell off and uh, he ended up picking back up cocaine and alcohol. And, uh, you know, at five years old, he left and uh, he went left for, I was living in New Hampshire. He left for West Virginia and he was in a car accident and it put him in a coma for 22 days and caused permanent brain damage. So um, from age five to age 20, I talked to my dad a total of three times on the phone. And I can even tell you what was said because it was so, you know, he just wasn't all there. So, um, but he drank himself to death. Um, so he, he literally, um, you know, uh, I'm kind of speeding the story way up, but, uh, yeah, that, that kind of was my, uh, jumping off point into severe substance, uh, dependence is when he passed away, even though I didn't have a relationship with him, it was just, a it was an interesting moment, but yeah, so that, that was kind of my father. He was, you know, his, his, my, my uncles are alcoholics and have passed away from this. Um, you know, so it really is rampant in the family. On your father, and, just um, on your father's side, uh, and on my mother's side um, too. My grandmother uh, also struggled with with alcoholism, um, so it's kind of both sides. And um, yeah, so that was that was my father. My mother, she, you know, she raised three boys on her own. You know, wow. so she was, were you the uh, youngest son. I'm the youngest. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so, yeah, so she ended up raising three birds, boys in a row. So at wow. five years old, we lost the house, you know, so we lost the house to addiction. And from there on out, you know, I lived in apartments and in different places and, and I had everything I need. And, and, but, you know, there was a lots of different things that started to appear after five years old, you know, um, thumb sucking and it might sound funny, but that became an addiction. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I literally would, I sucked my thumb up until I was nine years old. I was only playing pop Warner football contact football and I'd still suck my thumb and you know they almost kept me back a grade because of it and so wow. it sounds funny but it was uh yeah it was I a functional thumb sucker if there's a, such a thing 
Yeah, no, that's <laughs> not funny. Yeah, no, that's not funny. I mean, because the kids are so cruel, right? And um, it sounds like you were super stressed out, and that was like your coping mechanism, right? Absolutely. And then I would just replace that coping mechanism with another coping mechanism, which was which ended up being internet gaming and internet pornography at eleven yeah. and twelve years old, yeah. and that went for for many years until I found eventually I found alcohol and drugs. Okay. Uh, yeah. Gaming, um, and porn are huge, right? Especially for people like you had mentioned, I, maybe I just read it because of your, your book that you'd struggled with, um, you know, anxiety and social anxiety and stuff like that. But, um, I feel like, you know, you know, especially the internet porn is such an, um, it's an easy, quick release. Oh, well, <laughs> literally, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's so handy and it can be, um, so private. It's, just such easy access. So, um, yeah, that's, I actually interviewed somebody who talked about their sex addiction and that's how it started with um, childhood stress. You know, what did, what did your mom do to support the family? Um, she, she worked at Raytheon. Thank God she had a job. Oh, wow. at she worked there for almost 40 years. Smart, and, yeah. uh, thank God she had that job, but she often worked three jobs, you know, cause Raytheon didn't always pay the bills. Eventually it got better, but, um, you know, there was times where she'd work at Raytheon. She'd also be working at a local convenience store. She'd mm. do paper route. I mean, she's, a she's a, route. I really, wow. yeah. Like You're while working full time at Raytheon and raising, you know, her boys. So I get my, I could definitely tell I got my work ethic from my mom and, uh, that's yeah. why I work really hard at stuff. You know, it definitely what comes from her. And, um, so yeah, it was, she, she made it work and, um, it was, it was really a testament to her. Yeah, her no, that's, that's, um, we have a, um, a common thread there. My mom worked uh, high tech and she would often work three jobs and, and things like that. But yeah, um, mom's got to hustle too, right? That's right. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, good for her. And uh, what, were your, what was your relationship like with your older brothers? Um, so my older brothers actually have a different father. Uh -huh. Um, but we, um, my oldest brother, we had, uh, he was, he was, he's 12 years older than me. So he was kind of out of the house by the time, oh, wow. you, know, I, oh, you know, okay. he was out of the house soon. Uh, he, he was, he was on his own at 18, you know, doing his own thing. So mm -hmm. we didn't have a really close relationship, but, um, my middle brother though, we were very close. We were very close. We're eight years apart and, uh, we ended up being very close and, uh, he, 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 took the role as a father figure in many ways yeah. and uh, as I played sports and, and different things. And, uh, you know, so I was really grateful to have uh, his influence it was huge as a, as a child and uh, into teen and into high school. And yeah, so we were close and, um, and, you know, eventually, yeah, like the rest of this, how the rest of the story kind of goes is, you know, you touched on social anxiety and different things. So when I fell into those addictions at 12 years old, gaming and internet pornography, it wasn't like a mild thing. It was pretty severe. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I isolated in high school, you know, I didn't go to my prom, you know, all these different things. Oh. And so I wasn't going to go to college. And my mom was really incessant that I go to college because no one in the family has gone, had, had gone. Mm -hmm. So I got into college and I really found out what, what uh, addiction and addictive personality can look like uh, that first year of college. I bet. Yeah. yeah. So what was that first year of college like? I mean, you were virtually on your own, right? Mm -hmm. For the first time. And it was, I mean, that party scene is pretty intense your first year, right? Yeah. So I grew up in a, I grew up in, in the Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, it's not a huge city, but it's a city. And now I'm going to a college in this little town of Plymouth in New Hampshire. And uh, I've never even been to this town, but I decided to go to the school and it was, it was a party school. And so, but you know, I got there and I had every intention of making it work. You know, I had every intention. It was out of state tuition that first year. My mom had, you know, got a loan. So, you know, I went in there, I had every intention. And then next, you know, I found myself smoking weed every day and then I'm drinking and then I'm getting arrested by a state trooper and then I'm wow. getting caught in the dorms, uh, for drinking and, um, everything that I hit a lot of jackpots and I flunked out. So your first year flunked out my first year. Um, I failed all my classes the first semester and in the second semester I, I passed two and that wasn't good enough. So I, they shouldn't even let me back the second semester. That was a miracle for my mom writing a letter. And so 
you know, yeah, I flunked out. And, and from there, that's where things kind of went really downhill. So I, I flunked out of school, you know, I felt really defeated, right? Because mm. this was a, my mother who had struggled and really just said, you're the one that's going to make it. You're the one that's going to make it. And now I'm a failure, right? I flunked out of school. I'm a failure. And mm. this is the story I told myself. And then within uh, a year, my father passed away. And when that happened, even though I didn't have a relationship with him, that was a jumping off point. I got introduced to cocaine for the first time right after his death. And I just ran really hard with that. And uh, yeah. You know, that, um, when, I, when I read that, that's when, you, when your father died, that was when everything kicked up. You know what? Outside looking in, that, make per- that makes perfect sense to me, right? Because um, even if you were able to sweep it under the rug or bury it in your heart somehow, when somebody dies, that's the end. I mean, it's so final. There's no hope for reconciliation. There's, there's no hope that things can be different between, you know. So it's not surprising that everything that you had suppressed all those years sent you over the edge, right? Um, that must have been so traumatic. Yeah, and I think that's what it is. And I didn't realize that until deep into recovery. I mean, I'm, I think I was 12 years in recovery until I, when I realized that at five years old, I experienced trauma. Yeah. <laughs> when my father left Abandoned the house it. because yeah. of drinking and using cocaine, and then he got in a coma, you know, that was some trauma at five. And I really didn't process that till recently. And, yeah. and then when he passed away, you're right, I never got to process that whole, like, you weren't the there. And, life. Yeah. and so, yeah, and then from there, I just, I just, you know, you, 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 you read it in the big book. It says some of us only had to drink a few years, but we were as bad as those that drank 20 years. And that was me. I only had to really dive into drugs and alcohol a short time to see how severe this could be. And, you know, I took it after his death. I just took it. I mean, I was just, I was in places I never said I would. I mean, I, I, you know, it went from cocaine to shooting heroin to, you know, oxys to just all these the crazy things. And, and that, um, ironically led up to, so my father worked at a post office till he lost that job. And ironically, I was arrested in a post office <laughs> and that's where my recovery journey started. And so wow, that's weird. A lot of, there's a lot of synchronicities in my story. And, um, and I really pay attention to that now. And so, yeah, it was, it was pretty uh, amazing. So at 22, I, what I'd done is that I'd done the geographical cure because I got addicted to, what happened is I kicked heroin and cocaine cold turkey. I didn't tell anyone I had a problem. And I started drinking massive amounts of alcohol and taking pain pills. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I found my own way to get pain pills. So this is a message to anyone out there who's playing around with the internet and trying to order pills through the internet and get them shipped to them. I did that and I got caught and it cost me almost everything. And so- what happened is I was, I was getting these pills, oxys and Vicodin, and I was consuming massive amounts of these until I hit a really hard bottom with those. And I, and my, my friend at the time said, let's move to Florida. And I'm like, yeah, let's move to Florida. Cause I'm going to die. And he didn't know that of course. And I got to Florida. So I did the geographical cure, right? Cause Florida is going to help me with a pill problem in 2005. Like that's going to really help me. And, um, not at all. So I, I got down there and, and for nine months, it was just hell. The first few months, I was like, as long as I stay away from these drugs, I'll be okay. You know? right. And then, of course, within three, four months, I justified getting back on those. And it was right. just, it was pretty good. But I was that functioning, I was a functioning alcoholic, whatever you want to call it, a functioning right. person. I, I held two jobs until wow. I couldn't hold the jobs. And uh, I eventually... I had a really hard near death, ex- really, really close to death near death experience. And uh, I came back home to New Hampshire. And within a few weeks of being home, I got arrested. And um, thank God it was the best thing that ever happened to me because what, what they did is they, it, it all caught up to me ordering those pills over time. They built the case against me oh. and I was arrested with federal felons. Were they felon. tracking you? Yeah. Yep. So they had, it, they had it all there. They had arrested me prior. I didn't tell anyone. They had arrested me at a post office and I never told anyone. And it's, that's, a, that's what's so amazing about the mind of someone who is an addiction is we'll go to any lengths and, yeah. you know, to protect our addiction. And, and, you know, I should have told someone I was arrested. I didn't. And they built a case against me when I came back to New Hampshire, they got me. And uh, so I had essentially nine months of, or 10 months of experimenting whether or not I had an addiction problem when they let me go. And I found out, whoa, I got a serious problem. So it was almost a, a blessing. All of this to me, I, I, it's a reframe of 
this stuff like only made me um, a thousand times stronger today. Mm -hmm. So looking at that with that angle, it's, you know, yeah, I got arrested for federal felonies. I was looking at seven years in federal prison. Oh my gosh. How did you Uh, get out of that? So, you know, I had a court appointed lawyer, you know, and I, what I did is I just did how, how I really did it was at 22. I started to, I had this epiphany at 22 when I'm, you know, my family doesn't know how long I'm going to go away for all these things are happening. What I did is I started changing my habits. I literally just started changing my habits. I, I start. I found a support group. I found a mentor. I started reading. I started doing affirmations. I started using a calendar. I just literally turned it on. And cause I knew like going to federal prison at 22 years old was just not going to be good for me. And I, I got my full-time job back. So I was working full-time. I was attending support groups. I was, I was doing all these things I never had done in my life. And um, after about, they wanted to put me away. They kept lowering the sentence at uh, the, the time. And, and, I, and I just kept saying no. I was like, there's inner, you know, this inner connection I had to my creator. I was just like, no, this is, doesn't, I'm not going to federal prison. And so eventually I said, let me meet the prosecutor. And I did. And he ripped me apart. And I really thought I was going away to prison. But what ended up happening is after talking to him, uh, a year later on January, it was like January 4th, 2007, uh, 2007, I didn't do any time in prison. I took my federal felonies, three years probation. I never did any time. And from there on, I just kept doing the next right thing every single day, whatever that meant. I just asked that every morning in prayer. I said, just let me do the next right thing today. And um, now I'm, you know, 12 years later, I'm still doing that. That's amazing. Um, if can we go back to the near death experience? Uh, because I find that um, you know a lot of people have like their moment of clarity or their you know I keep I keep hearing this um, you know near, it's like a near death experience you know that that like when you get so close to dying and losing mm-hmm. it all, it's like we need to stand at the abyss sometimes before we can really snap back. You know something pulls us back. So can you tell me a little bit about what that near death experience was like? Um, yeah, so, all right, so I'm, I'm 22, I'm in Florida, I'm at the end of my run, my end of my run, and I'm, you know, I'm down there, I am miserable by all, all, I mean, just, I was barely hanging out of the jobs, I mean, I'm showing up to work, this employer would look at me and just be like, what is going on in your life, and, but, you know, they, I, I get to keep the job, and what happened was, I just, I got so deep into cocaine and and so I, what I would do is I would take pills all day and then I would do cocaine all night and I do it every day. Mm. And when you do that, what happens is your, your, your your membranes in your nose, you start to bleed out a lot and and that started happening all the time. And, and I got to a place where this one night I would literally tell myself, Hey, I'm not going to drink today. I'm not going to use today. Like I'm, I, I, I can't. And I'd go to work and I'd eat something by 4 p.m. I was, I was like, well, I feel better. And it would happen every day. And by 4 or 5 p.m. I'd be at the bar. Total and I would insanity. say like, well, I don't have a problem with alcohol. So I'd have one beer or one drink and I'd be like, bam, it would set off that phenomenon. And right mm-hmm. away I'd be calling my dealer. So it, it, I learned real quickly that alcohol leads me to the drugs. And yeah. so I can't do either one. So what ended up happening is this one night I just I – just, I don't even know how I pulled it off. I had, I had like owed money to banks. I had all this, these financial issues, but I had, I was able to get enough where I, I just consumed way more. I mixed too many things and I consumed too many things. And when I came home, I, I was like, I was in a really bad spot. I was like, in almost like in a gray out. And when I came, when I, when I went to go into my bed, I never could sleep, you know, right. But I, I lay in my bed and what happened was my, I noticed my heart was beating, you know, obviously your heart's going to beat really hard all the time when you do cocaine, but this right. particular time my heart would not stop pounding and it was pounding so hard. And this went on for about four hours straight. And I just laid there with this happening. And then all of a sudden what started happening, I started to see black bubbles and I started to like go into this. I started to hallucinate big time. Okay. And then the hallucinations got worse and worse and worse. And to the point where I was like, I'm literally going to die. Cause I, I, I could like see black. I could see black spots. I was like, I think I'm, I think I'm going to die. So what I did was instead of giving up, I called the hospital and I said, what's the normal heart rate of a human being? And they told me, and then I hung up and I shut my phone off and I decided that this is it. I'm going to die. And, um, you gave up. 
And it lasted, yeah, it lasted about four more hours, five more hours. And, um, and I had nothing, I didn't die. So I, 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 about now it's like 5 PM <laughs> cause I've been in, you know, I, and, and that was it. I had, um, it was the end of the, my roommate actually, I had a roommate. He was really concerned about me and he had finally went to the boss. It all happened perfectly connected. Like he went to the boss said he has a problem with these drugs and, um, I called back home. My family had no idea what was going on. I called back home and I said, I got the, and I couldn't even tell them the truth. I said, I, I have a problem, little problem with cocaine. I didn't talk about any of the other drugs. Right. And they're like, I, ha- I don't have any money. I need to come home. And they didn't really understand it, but they were like, okay, it was really just my brother. It was just that middle brother. I was telling you that was a father for you. I didn't even tell my mother. And so I, I ended up uh, packing my stuff ready to go. I had nothing anyways. And my room was, basically cockroaches, uh, a bureau I found in the trash and I'd pawned everything. I'm a pawner. I'm a salesman. You know, I, I sold all my stuff. I just had what I needed. To you just had some clothes and like somewhere to sleep and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I needed, you know, cause that's, I was basically living to drink or die and use. And so, um, I ended up had this intention to go home and I had no money. So my brother actually Western Union me money to get home and I picked up the money. I'll never forget, I went to Winn-Dixie to pick it up in the afternoon. And as soon as I got that money, I couldn't, I didn't have the willpower. I didn't have the power in me to resist and I ended up using again. And what happened is, um, and it was even after that near death experience, I had used a few more times and then my brother basically told me, he's like, if you don't, if, if you use this money again, I'm writing you off. And I knew I had no one else. I knew I had no one else. And, and at that point I was a very, I was like suicidal and I'm like, you know what, if I don't have him, then, you know, I, I don't know what to do. So I, I told my roommate, I said, you need to lock me in the house. I can't leave the house no matter what. I have the money to get home. I need you to lock me in this house so I don't leave. And that's what he did. He monitored oh, me. I didn't leave the house. Guy. And the next day I got in the car and I drove from Florida to New Jersey and I broke down because of exhaustion. And I stayed in a hotel there. And then I went from New Jersey to New Hampshire. And like I said, I got home and my mom had no idea what happened. And, um, you know, within a few weeks, I got arrested with the federal felonies. Thank God. Because I was going to keep going. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. So the perfect series of events just brought you to your knees and absolutely surrender. Yeah. And no one, you know, and, and I tell this, I, I don't say this to, for people to worry about having to hit such a hard bottom. Like you don't have to hit a hard bottom. No. You know, you could be high bottom. It doesn't matter. It's when you're ready to go. For me, I just, for whatever reason, that was my, I needed to take it there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, like I said today, all of that is just translates into resiliency and recovery and yeah. uh, using that as a strength and, and, and something to help others. You know, I love how in uh, Ryan Hampton's book, that his book that he has, American Fix, he says that uh, our stories, our stories not only save our own lives, they save other people's lives. And I truly believe that. Yeah. American Fix. I'll have to check that one out. Um, no, that's amazing. So how, so once you got arrested and all this, like, because you were facing jail time, that's when you started, it was like the act of desperation to try to, you know, get sober, yeah. like, can we walk me through how you were able to find recovery? Yeah. So the, the federal probation required that one, I don't drink alcohol and I don't do drugs. Nudge from the judge. We and like two, it. Yeah, and two, they required me to go to support meetings. So I had, I go to 12 step groups. They required it. And okay. I also, at the time I had, I also, they also required me to, to attend a, a therapist, a late act counselor. So okay. I went, from my, so I had a late act counselor. I mm-hmm. ended up having a, mentor that I found at uh, a church that I had my mom put me in because she didn't know if my mom didn't know if I was suicidal. She didn't know what was going to happen. So I ended up having a, a, a mentor who was a pastor. I had a late at counselor. I had the support groups. I got my full-time job back. I had no rehab, no drug court, none of these things that you see today. I literally just went cold turkey and mm-hmm. I went hard at all these things. And I also started to read. I started to read spiritual texts. I started to use affirmations because I had severe panic attacks that first year of recovery. I would have panic attacks multiple times a week where I'd literally literally black out and you know, your hands are soaked in sweat. I I have panic attacks constantly. So I started using affirmations 
to see if I could combat the panic attacks, you know, and, and so I just started to, and I started to use a calendar system. So every day I wrote on my calendar because I had to go do urine analysis, right? So right. on federal probation. So I, I would write in my calendar, okay, I got to go to work. I got to go to my 12 step meeting. I got to do my urine analysis. So I started to get this, this, this habit and routine of structuring my life, which ironically I still do it now. And I, you find out that the most successful people have a to-do list and they have goals and they have, um, a structure daily structure. And, yeah. and so I, I started doing that right away in recovery mm-hmm. and that paid off, that paid off big time. Um, but so these are all the things I was doing, but that first year was really tough. You know, lots of panic attacks, super stress. Cause I was looking at the federal felonies. And oh, so scary. My, my mom didn't know what to do. So she was, she was really stressed. There's just a lot. I caused a lot of stress. You know, that's the thing is we think, we're in our addiction. We're not hurting anyone but ourselves, but that's the biggest lie because you hurt everyone around you. And everyone you know, who loves you watches, watches especially you suffer. Your and so, yeah, that first year was just going to tons of 12 step groups. It was, it was reading, it was working full time. It was affirmations. It was exercise. It was all these things that I had never done, especially stacked together. And yeah, a year later, you- can I ask you, um, hopefully it's not too personal, what, uh, what affirmations did you use to combat anxiety? So the book that I was reading was the Bible. So that oh. book at 22, my, my mentor was a pastor. Oh, so yeah. he, he, would circle, he would circle scripture verses and give them mm-hmm. to me because I was, I was literally coming to him like, I got a lot of problems. Like I'm facing federal felonies. I have panic attacks. I have, and he'd be like, circle, hand me the book. And he'd be like, memorize these. And so I started to memorize these scripture verses and I would literally say them out loud in my mind all day long to try to prevent those panic attacks. And ironically enough today, I still use affirmations. They're not those affirmations, Uh but I still use them today to empower myself and to um, change that self-talk that I have. Oh yeah. So important. You were critic. talking earlier about the stories that you tell yourself, like nobody likes you and whatever. And, and so that's yeah. a voice that pops in. So I love having, I love the idea of having like a mantra or scripture or affirmation. What was, uh, do you remember which scriptures you used to, that you hung on to in the beginning? Oh, that's funny. Oh my God. No one's ever asked me that. Um, do you remember? I mean, I know it was 12 years I, ago. Uh, if you can't remember off the top I, of your head. I think head. I remember a couple. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. It, but I don't want to scare anyone either that like what I'm saying is like, oh, you have to be Christian. You have to be this. You have to be that. Because that's. Oh, okay. That's, well, no. Yeah. From where, from, from where I'm coming from. Yes. But I'll tell you that. Um, it's just what works I, for you. It's, it, it worked for me. Yeah. And then yeah. You, you, you know, and things. Okay. So the one that I can remember is. Uh, okay. Um. Okay, so I, ha- I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So that would be, that would be an example. I love of, that. Uh, Those yeah, are beautiful words. I don't care where they come from. Well, exactly. It, there, I, I felt power in them. I felt power from my mentor and I wanted to just use them because I felt there was something there and, and that's what I used. And that was one of about probably 20 that I would say on a regular basis. Oh, no. Did you, how, did you grow up with uh, religion? N- not really. I mean, my mom, my mom went to like different, she, <laughs> she bounced around from different groups and uh-huh. um, she, she was there was always seeker. an idea. It was, yeah. She was a seeker. There's always an idea of, of there's this power greater than myself. Yeah. And yeah. then of course, when you get into addiction, you're like, well, screw that power greater than myself because now my power greater than myself is my addiction. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I replaced it. But eventually when you, when you're faced with circumstances that are very trying, you mm-hmm. come back to seek. And so mm-hmm. I, 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 that's what I did. And, and so today, like the most important part of my life today is my meditation practice, you mm. know, prayer meditation. I mean, I meditate 20 minutes a day every day. And you know, this is the most important thing I do all day and Mm -hmm. my morning routine. And, and so that connection, you know, and it's the most important thing. What do you, what do you refer to? Like, I think there's a fear, like, especially, you know, people like you and I, who talk to a lot of people, uh, we don't want to alienate anybody. 
you know, so I, I'll speak for myself in saying that, you know, I grew up in the, in the, with the Christian religion. Um, and when I did drugs and stuff like that, I totally got away from that. I thought God abandoned me, but really it was, I just, God didn't fix strike me perfect. And I, you know, I didn't know how to hand, <laughs> handle being human. So I, I just got away from it completely. And then circling back to recovery, it's like I had to sort of ease my way back into the idea of a higher power. And I've kind of come full circle where, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the words from the Christian religion still resonate. And I don't know whether it's because I'm indoctrinated or, but I don't even care because healing yeah. words are just healing words. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And I appreciate um, Buddhism and the Jewish religion and all the religions, you know, but is, mm -hmm. does, is, is the Bible and, it, you know, I talk to people from Celebrate Recovery and Refuge Recovery, Smart Recovery, all, it does, it does, but it's interesting to hear about other people's higher power. So how, how that was a long, this is a long winded way to ask you what your higher power is. How do you think of it? <laughs> do you define, do you define wow. it? Is it something that you just feel while you meditate or maybe you could walk me through that a little bit? Okay. Yeah. So I, I would say that we're, I'm always evolving. I'm right. someone, I'm a, I'm a seeker big time. Yeah, if you get me to know too. me, I'm a very passionate person and I have people that come into my life that are very passionate yeah. and they'll come into my life and say, I want you to watch this. I want you to read this. I want you to do this. And so they influenced me. Mm -hmm. So where I had this one idea of viewpoint of a higher power, God creator, that it evolves constantly because I meet people who are spiritual people and they'll say to me, hey, why don't you check out this film? Why don't you check out this book? Why don't you do it? And I, and I will say to them, yeah, you know what? I will. And I do that and it expands right. my worldview. So I think that's really important for me. And so you know, I would say that, you know, my higher power, my creator, it's, with, it's within me and it's within all of us. That's mm -hmm. the truth. We have the power within. I tap that, I tap into that power to be able to help myself and help others, you know, and that's, and that's the direction I take. I trust if you, if you, you know, my next book is going to have a lot of this in there about in, intuition. You know, it's about habits, but it's really about my intuition. So oh, I trust yeah. my intuition. I trust my gut more than I trust any man or woman. That, mm -hmm. That's what I trust is my intuition. And well, what is intuition? Well, some would say it's the spirit, it's energy. It's, mm -hmm. And for me, I go, it's all those things. Mm -hmm. I don't need to define those just one thing of whether it's a spirit, a Holy Spirit, energy, a force, a matrix, divine matrix. To me, it's all of those things. So I yeah. just take them all and use that. And I find that, you know, and I'm not afraid to be, I'm, I'm exactly like you. I'm a total seeker. I, I love reading different books and talking to different people. And what I find is that truth does not contradict itself, right? Like there, you know, there's a time and a season for everything. And, you know, it's a funny thing about recovery is that a lot of the um, information that we get is, in conflict based on context, right? Context is everything, but truth does not, truth does not, truth is truth. It doesn't conflict with itself. So it doesn't matter where you get it, like whether it's from the Christian religion or the Muslim religion or Jewish religion, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's like there's the, those themes of truth run through, through them all. Yeah. So it's with inside all of us and we have, a, we have the right and the to, to tap in and, and to define to what's true for us. And, mm -hmm. and that, and that's how I look at it. And, uh, but that, I mean, this is a major part of my life. This is every single day. This is part of my recovery. This is part of, you know, and you talk to successful people, whether they're in recovery or not, and they meditate. I mean, they do these <laughs> things because they know there's yeah. something greater. That's how is this moon pulling the ocean to the tides? And how is the sun, this gas ball of energy, like, if it wasn't th like, how is this all happening? Like, I, I'm just like this little speck in this massive, and we're just yeah. one, one galaxy. And there's, right, right. So it's like, you know, so when you start yeah. to think bigger and globally, mm -hmm. you start to think like, wow, like how is all this happening? How did, like, how did, how does nature have like, just they, like nature knows what to do. It, 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 Infinite it and health. knows so yeah. So I, you know, I don't have the answers, you know, no one does. Bill Wilson didn't have the answers. No one, does. you know, so it's just, you know, it, it's just one of those things and, and you yeah. got to find what's true for you. 
Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I love that you talk about your um, ideas evolve because we're all always evolving, right? And as new information comes in, I have to sort of um, assimilate, assimilate that information into what I think I already know. And um, I'm doing, right now I'm doing this thing called the set aside prayer from Big Book Awakening. I don't know. Yeah. Isn't that great? I see you nodding. Yeah. Um, I know that one. Isn't that great? Um, and it, it's funny because I will, um, you know, I've been sober for a long time too, but it doesn't mean that I'm not human. Right. And then, um, at, lately it's like, sometimes I get so like, I'm an entrepreneur too. So I, I love that you have this and I'm going to have to like get involved with your entrepreneurs and recovery and stuff. Cause I need a group of people who understand my kind of crazy because don't you find, and let, maybe you can just do a little counseling on me now and <laughs> do a little <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Well, we'll do a little coaching call. We'll show everyone how amazing you are. Um, Great. There's this idea that I have in my mind I, that I've been wrestling with. And maybe you can help me out. That um, as an entrepreneur, I'm trying to take my life to the next level, right? I'm sort mm -hmm. of struggling and str like I, my thing has always been money. Like I have a great relationship with my family and my husband and all that stuff. Money is my one thing. And mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial ideas are the, that seems to be like my current, my current drug, um, workaholism and all that stuff. But I'm trying to take my life to the next level. And it's a struggle. So th what I struggle with is how do I turn my will and my life over to the care of God and still try to take my life to the next level? There seems to be this, um, like I have this idea in my head that God's not going to do for me what I can do for myself, right? I need to do the footwork. And then my sponsor is like, oh, you're totally in self-will. But... <laughs> Do you know where I'm going with this? I just yep. feel like I'm in this loop or this trap and I, I don't know how to stay sane while trying to be a successful entrepreneur. Well, what it really comes down to is abundance. So you, if you're someone who is a good, so let's just talk about money, right? Mm -hmm. The people that have money, okay, if, if you're someone who is like, there's many, many rich people that are amazing, game-changing, world-changing people. Thank God for those people because they yeah. start nonprofits and they start these. But there's also people with money who are bad people. You know, they're not good people. So, but for some reason, we look at all people with money as being ignorant and um, being uh, bad and selfish, which is not the truth. It's, uh -huh. And the reason why we don't know that is because we weren't taught that. You don't learn money. You don't learn about money in school. I don't know money in college. No one's teaching me this. So it's in when you seek your own, when you go and start to read books and you start to, you know, find mentors and you start to find people who have money, you learn about it. And, you know, like, let's say like Joe Polish, you know, and he's yeah. someone who's in recovery. And, you know, uh, he says uh, people that people, people who think that money doesn't um, bring happiness uh, haven't given enough of it away. Oh, and I love that. Like people who, who don't believe money brings happiness haven't given enough of it away. Mm -hmm. And and I believe, and so, you know, it's all about your money mindset. Like how do you look at money? Mm -hmm. If you're someone like me or you who's out there trying to help all these people to live their full potential, who better than us to have money to be yeah. able to complete that mission? We're the people who should have the money because, and I don't, I'm not saying that we're going to sit on the couch and the money's just going to show up in bags on my doorstep. But what yeah. I'm saying is being in action and being in motion to do good in the world. Um, yes, we should be abundant and have ways to finance our dreams, which are to impact the world and help people. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. that's where that shift comes. It's like we should be having abundance if we're doing the right things and learning about money, but also our, if our intentions are true, are, are, is that what we really are doing? It, they are true. So, you know, there's no one better than, than entrepreneurs who are, you know, on a mission to help, especially with addiction. I mean, this is a national health crisis. So having oh, people on the front lines like us to have money, if we don't have money, I can't travel across the country and do my facilitation. If right. I don't have money, I can't spread this and build a training to be able to then teach people to do the facilitation I do. That takes right. money. That takes resources. So yeah. we're the, so that's, you know, that's that money. And there's so many great books about money mindset. 
yeah. you know, so if, if you want to read a really good book or listen to a great book, um, uh, how to, how to be a, uh, what is it? Hold on. Let me see. It's called, you are a badass at making money. <laughs> I have yeah. that one. Yeah. So that book yeah. is a great one to start with. And mm-hmm. then there's many, many others, but like that just shows you that like you, it's all about programming. It's cultural programming and it's our history of programming mm. that we have these beliefs about money, which are untrue. Right. And so when you surround yourself with people who are good people making big change in the world who have money, you start to change your paradigm and you go, right. wow, uh, I was like fed a lie. That's not true at all. And, you know, so I believe that people, entrepreneurs who are on a mission to change the world should have abundance, yes. but they have to have that change in their mindset to believe that. And then they will have it and then they can ultimately impact the world because that's what we're, we're here to do. You know? Yeah. I have a sober life school. I started creating digital products around um, different topics re- related to recovery. And so that's really what I'm passionate about. And you mentioned, um, th- like I'm also in sales. I'm, I'm still working in the corporate world at the same time as I'm doing all this, this other stuff. So it's, it's sort of in that uh, limbo, but it's so cool to see that you're doing, you're doing your passion full time. How, how are you able to make that leap? You talked about being in sales and corporate and then you made the leap and now you're doing this full time. So yeah, that, I mean, I definitely, I probably, most people would probably be pulling their hair. I don't have any hair, so I don't have to pull out my hair. But <laughs> I, I just, what I did was last year I made, um, after having this epiphany that I really needed to do something in the world that's going to impact people in addiction recovery and mental health. Yeah. I, I said, how can I make that happen? What, what does that look like? And I started asking new questions. New questions. questions. I love that. These new questions brought up answers from my subconscious and my conscious mind of like, well, how, what would that look like? And mm-hmm. then I all of a sudden had this out of a meditation, entrepreneurs in recovery came to me, you know, this idea of entrepreneurs in recovery. And that was last year in March. Mm-hmm. And so what I did in March is I wrote on a card, I wrote, I have it right here. I still keep it near me. This is a goal card. Someone handed this to me in the airport. and this is someone I knew, but it's a goal. You write your biggest goal of the year. And last year I wrote, write one book. And then I crossed it off and I put write two books and I crossed that off. I said, I want to play much bigger, right? I'm a comfort zone guy. I'm all about smashing your comfort zone. So I'm like, what would scare the crap? What would scare me more than anything? It would be to leave my nine to five job (laughs) and be my own boss to wake up every day with purpose to impact lives as a business. How could I do that? And I wrote it on this card. And I wrote a date, August yes. 30th, 2017. And guess what? I left my job August 25th, 2017. Oh my years. God, I love that. I had just that. landed my dream job. I had just landed that job, the six-figure job that I've been working 13 years to get. And I left that job. <gasps> oh, really? So I really went for it. But here's what happens. When you, conspire, when you go for it, the universe conspires to help you. And what I did was when I left the job, I did not have the money to make it happen. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I literally I was writing down the countdown in my journal every day of how many days I had left to work in corporate. And I still didn't know how I was going to do it. You know what happened? My best friend was sitting across to me at a restaurant and he looked at me and he says, because what I didn't tell you in this story is that I bought my first home. You know, we had lost our home to addiction mm. and I'd never lived in another home. You know, I lived, you, a home is where your heart is, right? But as far as actually an actual home. Like a house. I had, yeah, a house. I hadn't lived in a house uh, from that five years old all the way up until I bought my first house six years in recovery. And it meant the world to me. Cause I'm like, I did it. I made this happen. And you know, okay. obviously with the help of, you know, it takes a village, but sure. I made this happen and on my own, I bought a house. And so what I did was I was sitting across from my best friend, Pete, and he goes, why don't you sell your home? You don't even like you live by yourself. Why don't you just sell your home? You bought this home as a foreclosure. Now it's worth like way more. He's like, you should just sell your home. And this was in July. And I was like, oh my God, you're, that's exactly what I should do. And I, and I sold my house in three days. I put on the market. The first person who looked at it bought my house. I made a ton of money. And that was the money that fueled the dream up until today to be able oh to get training and to be able to learn like, how can I make, and I made tons of mistakes with the money, tons. And I could, I could have a whole nother podcast about that'll be another book. <laughs> that's in the, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So, yeah. so that's how, that's where it came. So it didn't come until July 
And then I knew it was 100% going to happen in August. And then I didn't even know about the facilitation until September. Uh-huh. And then in September, I, I said, okay, I'll do the facilitation, which was ex- for me at the time was expensive. And in October, I started the facilitation and that became the number one source of my income. It became my number one driver. I had was none that, of those answers. That is so yeah. crazy. It, which, uh, that was the LEAF facilitation? The facilitation was in October last year. Wow. And that's oh what I do God. primarily. That's where the most momentum is in my life. Besides, you know, writing a book and writing my next book, the most momentum is in my f- f- facilitation I do. Okay. Um, so that was like a certification training that you did and yeah, it's a six, it's, it was a six month certification training and appreciative inquiry, but using it, you know, uh, being certified as a facilitator to use Mm -hmm. that methodology. To use Um, methodology. Um, do you want to break down a little bit about like, if people want to hire, hire you for this, what is the, um, can you break down what the process is for the facilitation? Yeah. So what I do right now is I work with local treatment centers and uh, sober living facilities and I run a 60 minute group, which is run during normal IOP groups. So I'm fitting into an existing model that's already there and I'm just coming in for an hour and I take the clients through that and I get paid to do that per hour at these places. Mm -hmm. I also use this for now with towns, like now with Albemarle, like now I can bring this into towns and design a two hour workshop and help take a town through a process of finding what the best of what's already there in that town for community-based recovery. And then what's the future and how do we prototype designs for 2019 or and beyond of how we're going to attack the epidemic. So that's a new thing. And then the third thing, the next element is training people in the, in what I've learned, um, training people and uh, teaching them appreciative recovery facilitation so they can go in, especially if they're passionate about pe- working with people in recovery and mm-hmm. they can run these groups themselves. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That is so exciting that you just set the intention, that you set the goal, and you ask the right questions. I keep I, I keep coming back to that. It's asking the right questions, like whatever you, I don't know mm-hmm. if you ever followed t- Tony Robbins, or that was the first, I kind of, oh. yeah, <laughs> I came across uh, his information uh, more than 25 years ago, just before I got sober. And I really feel like that was um, one of the things that helped me get sober is that it just opened my mind that if I could um, change my mind, change the way I think and my beliefs, identify what my core beliefs were and then change those that my life would be different. And then I soon found 12 step programs and things like that. And that's how I, and so I've just, I'm like you, I'm a, a seeker. I've just been on this quest to, you know, evolve into a better person. And it's so funny, Jesse, don't you find that as you find the answers, you're like, oh my gosh, everybody needs to know this. Absolutely. That's how I've always been. I've always been like that. And even when people don't want to listen, I'm like, no, so I I know there's something to this. And and nowadays that's my whole life. Nowadays, my whole life is just anything I find, I want to give it away because this stuff is really helping me. And um, yeah, Tony, you know, Tony has helped me a lot too. And um, it's great. No, that's amazing. Um, Yeah. We give it away to keep it right. One of those. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> One of those funny things. And so tell me a little bit more about your book. Um, I want to dig into that because uh, first, what is the, what is the title? Cause that kind of says it all. Smash your comfort zone with cold showers. Yeah. So that's when I heard that I was like, cold showers, come on, Jesse. But the funny thing is, is I, um, I'm a Tim Ferriss fan and he had a guest on um, Wim Hof. Right. And then I go to, and he's all about, you know, the cold water treatments and all that. And, um, I went to a Tony Robbins event and there's Wim Hof again, doing the breathing techniques. And, but it was so interesting to hear the history of how, um, even like back in medieval times, they used to use cold water to treat mental illness, even right way back when so maybe you can sort of give me the sort of scientific reasons why the the cold water therapy actually works like what's it all about yeah so uh you'd have to go back to where i first started doing cold showers um i i was someone this is i live in new hampshire and it was december and it was 38 degrees out so there's no way i'm going to take cold showers but my friend Nick, who is actually in my book, I, 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 you know, I, I give him all the credit because he, 
Nick is like a pioneer. He's someone in recovery, but he's just an amazing guy. And he, he, he just knew he's the type of guy that just kind of knows kind of, he has these epiphanies and he tells you and he's right. He's one of those guys. And uh -huh. he said to me, Hey, you should start taking uh, cold showers for 30 days. And I said, no way, no way. Free Why would I ever do that? No way. I love hot showers. I'm a hot shower addict. I'm not taking cold showers. And Seems my ridiculous. roommate at the time, yeah. So my roommate at the time, I've only had a roommate once for a short period of time. He immediately ran upstairs, and upstairs, and he took a cold shower. How long and is this cold shower? Five minutes. Well, here's the thing: the cold showers that I do, you don't have to do. I take them straight cold, but you don't have to do that. You okay. can take them warm and then finish them cold, and you'll still have benefits. Lots of benefits. Okay. okay. So. So don't worry, I don't want to scare anyone. You don't have to take them straight cold. I, I just take them straight cold. So my, friend, my, my best friend ran upstairs. He took a cold shower. And I was like, it was 5 p.m. at night. It was 38 degrees out. I'm like, oh, my God. So what I did is said, I, I have to do this. And so I, I went to my shower. I turned the nozzle all the way cold, which was a bad idea. And, <laughs> and then I turned on some music. And I jumped in. And I lost my breath for like, I don't know, 10 seconds at least. And then... And then I stayed in the shower for five minutes. And wow, I, I it's intense. That shower. I came out and I literally felt, I felt like euphoric. I felt like this, really? this high. I felt this natural high. And obviously I had been chasing highs my whole life. <laughs> right. and I'm in recovery and I got this natural high. So I'm like, wow. And then the key was this. This is what got me to, to make it stick is I was going to this group that night and every time I went to that group, I had social anxiety. Like even in recovery at 10 years, I still had social anxiety. And mm -hmm. at times I couldn't even leave the house to go to the supermarket to go food shopping. And this is in recovery and this has done, done all the work I've done on myself. Yeah. And so this is three years ago and I'm just like, you know, so anyways, I went to the same group that I always went to and I had no anxiety at all. I walked in there, I sat down, I felt comfortable. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I didn't do anything differently but to take a cold shower. And so I said, you know what? I'm taking these for 30 days. And then I started journaling the whole journey and I started taking them. And, and what I started to notice was that not only was my anxiety reduced big time, my confidence was going up. Hmm. I had way more energy and I started to take more risks right away. Like I started to take more risks. And what happened was I ended up winning this award. Um, um, I, it was for my past performance at my job. I won this award to Switzerland. It was a paid trip to Switzerland. It's the highest award my company has to offer called President's Cabinet. So mm -hmm. now I'm in Switzerland in 20 degree weather and I'm still taking cold showers. And this is three, four months later. And I just never stopped. And now it's been wow. a thousand showers, three years uh, in a row. And I still take them. And it's because of that very first shower. It, it showed me the, the power of, of cold water. And, you know, Tony Robbins, Tim Ferriss, there's so many people who who expose themselves to cold water or cold showers or a cold plunge every yeah. single day. They're not just doing, they don't need to do that, right? Why would they do that? They have the money, they have all that, but they do it because it's good for them. And they know what it does for your mindset, your body, your skin. And so I just decide, you know, of course, the reason why the book I written is someone, I would tell people this. And last year I was telling people this and they're like, why don't you write a book? And then I said, I'll write a little book. And that's what I did. And it took some time for it to be completed because you have a, I have a, perf I don't know if anyone can relate to this, the perfectionism thing <laughs> comes on and yeah. then resistance happens big time oh, and then fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had to work through all that to be able to then say, this book needs to be out. And that's a message for anyone who's thinking about writing a book or hasn't done it yet. Your book needs to be in the world. Now my book's out. It's like, ah, oh, and like today's the release of the paperback book. So, that's so amazing. You know, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, why does it work? Why does the cold showers work? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah I, have a, I have so many questions like flooding my mind right now. It's like, well, how long does this shower have to be? And can I start with a, can I start with a cold shower and end with a warm shower or does it have to be? Yeah. Okay. So here's what I recommend. And this is now I am no, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm not, I'm not a Wim Hof. I'm none of those things. I'm just someone who I did it and it worked and I do things that I like. Anything that makes me feel good, that's good yeah. for me. I'll do it. More. And I do it yeah. all the time. And <laughs> right. that's what cold showers do. So I, so you don't have to take a cold shower cold all the time. You can literally take your normal 10 minute, five minute, 20 minute, whatever warm shower you normally take. But the key is the last 60 seconds. Start with okay. 30, start with 10. Okay. Working from 10 to 30 seconds, to 60 seconds, 
cold, always end the shower cold. And sh- uh, end cold, okay. End it cold. And you can even go back and forth, the hot, the cold, the hot. It's yeah, called a contract shower. You can, you can go back and forth. And there's, you know, there's a st- really, there's a study about depression in contrast sh- and showers. And I actually got to interview, well, not interview, but I got to talk to this, this person who actually wrote that article. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so he, he you know, he, 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 cold showers can help with depression. For treatment of so, depression, yeah. And there's an article out about that. I, I did put that in my book. And um, so, yeah, so it's, you don't have to, I think people, this is why I want people to read my book is because this is what happens every time someone reads my book. I have people who tell me, these are professors at colleges. They'll go, hey, listen, I want to support you. I'm never going to take old shower, but I really, I, I love what you're doing. I'll read your book, but I'm not taking it. And I go, no problem. They read the book. And literally the day they read the book, they text me, email me, or call me and say, hey, I'm going to take a cold shower, or I just took a cold shower. So I get people who are very skeptical to do the shower, and they don't take them straight cold. They'll, they'll do their warm shower and end it cold because they didn't know they had yeah. permission to do that. And that's right. really good. So you want to start small and okay. work your way up. Okay. Right. Now that, that makes sense. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I, I hate being cold, but I'm totally going to try that. Cause <laughs> what's that saying? It's like, if you never do anything different, you'll keep getting the same thing. <laughs> well, what I believe is, is facing tiny, small fears every day mm-hmm. leads up to a more, a more emotional resilience. And you become a more resilient person who, who decides to take other risks in their life. Mm-hmm. And just by starting your day with a cold shower, you're basically telling your mind, you're telling your, your inner critic, like, hey, shut up. I'm going to face fears today, just like I did in the morning with my shower. It boosted my energy. I mean, I quit caffeine taking showers, cold That's showers. Amazing. So, I mean, uh, I never would have the confidence to quit caffeine because, you know, in recovery, it's like, oh, I need, I'm keeping my caffeine. I put all no, the I've other. I've been sipping my I'm coffee not, the whole time we've been talking. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with, ca- I'm not knocking caffeine, but sure. the way I was using it, it was just not healthy. And I talk about that in my book and how cold showers help with that. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's really about, if I was to say, why did you write, why did you write this book is because not only did they, did they help in many ways, cold showers, but the biggest thing is breaking patterns, breaking, breaking bad, patterns. bad habits and routines and, and unwanted habits. It's like, that's what it helped me to do. And I was able to really look at other habits and, and things that I was doing in recovery and been, and I was able to, to do other things. So it, it, it brought awareness and Getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is an important thing. It's really key to to changing and, like we said, evolving. Mm-hmm. And evolving, yeah. for me, cold showers is is the start every day to 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 get that going. Yeah, and I'd be interested to uh, sort of dig into the science about it. Like, it must set off like you know, like running does kicks out endorphins. I would yeah. imagine well, no, that- it does. It does. In my book, yeah. I, I and again, I wrote a very short book purposely because yeah. I want people to finish the book. So I didn't want to write a 150 page cold shower book. I wrote, you know, an, a, a 50 page, I think the paperback comes out to 80 pages, but it's really like 50 pages of yeah. information. And I touch on the science a little bit. I talk mm-hmm. about how it affects your sympathetic nervous system, mm. you know, because the fight or flight, it activates, it's a primer and it gets you going. And uh, you need both. You need you need the you need the rest. You need the, the you need the calming and the arousing systems. And cold showers activates the sympathetic nervous system, and it also it does other things too. But I I I, I took I talked about the sympathetic nervous system a little bit, and that's because I talked to a bunch of people before I released this book who who are been taking cold showers their whole life, and some yeah. are doctors. So yeah. I didn't just release the book. I talked to a bunch of people who are from Europe and Germany and all these places where cold what cold. Sh- where, where hydrotherapy and cold shower, uh, cold water treatment, it's normal. It's just not here. We don't hear about it. But over there in like Finland and Russia and different places, they, they practice this stuff. Yeah, no, and I've been hearing a lot about it from, you know, I've mentioned Tim Ferriss a couple of times. He's always uh, talking to higher performers. You know, what makes somebody a high performer? What is it that they're, you know, the tools and tactics, you know, of the high performer, world-class performers? So uh, hydrotherapy mm-hmm. keeps coming up, and I just think that's super interesting, you know, along with meditation and things like that. Um, awesome. I cannot wait to share this with everyone. Um, Jesse, why don't you share some links of how do people get a hold of you? Where could they learn more about you? I know you have jessieharless.com. Is that a great place to start, or what links would you like people like me to yeah, share? I would say um, – <clears throat> you can go to jessieharless.com 
Um, you'll learn about me. You'll learn about appreciative recovery facilitation. You'll learn about my book. Um, you could also go to entrepreneursinrecovery.com. Um, and so those are the two places I'd, 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 I'd go to. You can email me there. Or you can, um, yeah, you could, you could follow me with, at Entrepreneurs in Recovery okay. on uh, Instagram and Facebook. I just post quotes. You know, I haven't done anything major for social media in those spots, but I just go to my websites. That's okay. Yeah, we'll start. And that's J-E-S-S-E Harless, H-R-L-E-S-S dot com. Awesome. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and, and sharing this with me. I can't wait to get to know you better. And I, I'm going to involve myself in your life with the entrepreneurs in recovery. <laughs> so you, 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 can, you can help me uh, get my sober life school off the ground so that we can help heal the world. That's right. Yep. Awesome. We have to do it. Yes. Great. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time today. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Alina. All right. You have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.